What's up? Welcome in Hogue and John's back with you. Friday edition of the show. Hope it, hopefully everybody's having a good week, gearing up for a good weekend. Should be beautiful in Chicago. Nice weather, golf on TV. We're flirting with 80 on Sunday. So we'd finally get there. Famous last words right there. It'll snow in two weeks. <laughs> in two weeks, though, the draft is here. So. Yes. Under two weeks, less than two weeks. Honestly, if it wants to be crappy that entire weekend, that's fine. We, we're going to be working. We'll be in House Hall with right. the windowless media room. Well, I'll be at Joe's on Wheat Street. No. Oh. You can enjoy House Hall. We're going to oh. be having a draft party. <laughs> CH Joe's going to be celebrating Caleb Williams coming to the Bears. And if you guys want to come, you can. I actually, here's the thing. I, I'm not, we're not doing this now. I might have some tickets to give away on this show for the CHGO draft party next week. Will part of that package, that ticket package, include uh, a potential picture with Carmen Braggs in their soldier outfits? <laughs> we should bring those. I didn't Why, think about that. What, what was the, what's the description for? Um, I think that's Royal the, Guards. The, the Royal Guard, I think. Or the yeah. King's Guard. King's Guard. Queen's so Guard. Maybe, maybe it used to be the King's Guard, and now they call it the Royal Guard for obvious reasons. It's not the Queen's Guard. Queen is uh, no longer with us there, Johnsy. True. Yeah. Um, Royal Guard. Yeah, I think it's the Royal Guard. Kings. Guard. We, we have we have Kings some out, we have some outtakes from that that have not been released too. They did a good job with that. We're going to London. If anybody Do some wants of them to. include them losing their hats. Um, I'm no spoilers here. No spoilers. I may have chucked one of the hats off the roof. The only question I have about that commercial <laughs> is whether you actually knew that they would be in the King's Guard outfit as you came out of the uh, well, the roof door. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yes, I did know. See, that's where you need to be surprised as well to get the most natural reaction. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. The problem is I have to plan all this stuff too. Although Jake Flanagan did most of the work behind that, but it's I, I get your point and I agree with you, but um, it wasn't really possible. Taking care of Carmen Braggs, it's like it's enough it's, planning. <laughs> it's like two other children I have in my life that I just, you know, it's we do the best we can. Um, all right. Well, if you missed any of that, go to this uh, at CHGO underscore bears and you can see the. Uh, do you some think, of the, do you some think of we could convince Kevin Fishbane to, to dress in a Kingsguard outfit? Ooh, <laughs> the answer would be no. I think we should. One time, this is all I'm going to give you on this story, but one time we were at a piano bar in San Diego. Oh, I was there. Yes, you were there. Yeah. And I paid some money to get Kevin Fishbane on the stage. Mm hmm. Right. You know what happens? You know, he's got to sit on the piano for the piano bar. They sing him a song. It could be inappropriate. That dude walked out of the bar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he wanted no part of that. Yes, I believe I believe Jeff Dickerson was there. I want to say Rich Campbell was there. I think you're correct. Our wives were there. And we were all very excited. I paid good money for that. I bet you did. And uh, Kevin just left. Left his building. He out the door. They're, they're calling for Kevin. He goes, whoop. Nope. <laughs> not doing that. Nope. I will see you guys tomorrow. That's a true story. That actually did happen. I miss going to is San Diego the city you miss going to the most? Of? Well, we only went once, so maybe I know. <laughs> but like, you don't miss going to St. Louis. Our good friend Patrick Finley would say yes. Yeah, San Diego native. Well, he's still there like every other week. San Diegan, San Diegan. Yeah, I Will Ferrell reference there. Anchorman. I saw some Will Ferrell in my timeline yesterday from some old uh, O.J. Simpson SNL videos. Tim Meadows. I was very, it was it was something therapeutic about o, the day O.J. Simpson died becoming a Norm MacDonald uh, Remembrance Day. Oh, well, because of his. Oh, was, well, Norm Crespies, right? The SBs Every single week on Weekend Update on SNL and to the point where he got fired. Because he wouldn't stop making fun of O.J. Simpson. 
that was the story. So karma coming all the way around where, I mean, I guess it's not all the way around, but just Norm getting his props on the day that OJ died. Uh, there was something about that that I enjoyed, partially because I just love Norm, Norm McDonald so much. This is weird. This, this, How did this podcast start this way? I don't know, and I don't. I love it, and um, I feel like we're not done with the comedy references, especially from nine from the nineties uh, before the show's over. So we'll we'll see we'll see how this all goes. Um, in the meantime, though, we do have some serious football to discuss. We have a draft that's now less than two weeks away. Caleb Williams will be at the draft, by the way, which the NFL officially announced, and um, we have Randy Mueller on the show to discuss some of the stuff the athletics resident football gm um of course all everything off the top here make sure you're following us on twitter at adam hogue at adam johns all the coverage in the athletic the athletic.com slash hogan johns which now includes the beast it's out it's ready to go you can consume it it is massive it is right here in front of me all printed out love it i was trying to figure out John's why this costs 30 more dollars this year for me to print than it did last year. And the reason was actually very obvious right in front of me. There's more pages. There's more so information. More. There's just, you know, I thought the same going through, even just reading the quarterback section. Yeah. The everything's longer. I mean, Dane put so much time into this, man. I'm looking forward to talking to him next week. I mean, it's just, an impressive feat every single year that he produces. It's it's crazy. So uh, make sure you check it out. If you're an athletic subscriber, you get access to it. Theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns is where you go to. You can get it there or you can subscribe there if you're not already a subscriber. So go check it out. All right. Randy Mueller. Uh, we last talked to him at the Combine. Former GM in the league for a long time. Seahawks, Chargers. A um, lot of great information. And... He, you know, he's still he's still very much involved in all this stuff and scouting all these prospects. He's been pretty dialed in and has had some information too on the bear stuff specifically here. Uh really in depth on Caleb Williams. You learned all if you went back and listened to our episode or you heard it at the time from Indianapolis, you would have heard all that stuff. So Randy's great. We will uh, I do want to warn you a little bit because we pre-recorded the Randy conversation. The uh, quality on this is not the best. So we do apologize for that. Especially if you're watching on YouTube, it's more the video quality that's kind of really fuzzy. Um, but the content's all good, and I think we probably have the audio cleaned up enough that it sounds just fine if you're listening to the podcast version. But bear with us a little bit on the video side. Um, I, I think he was in a uh, top secret location that didn't have uh, he is the best Wi-Fi, and um, so that's okay. The information's great. Randy Mueller on the show with us today. Let's jump right in. All right, let's bring Randy Mueller back into the podcast. It's uh, been a little bit since the NFL Combine. Last time he was on the show, and of course, um, a lot has changed. Uh, you can hear Randy on the football GM portion of the Athletic Football Show podcast feed. He does that with Mike Sando. Really good show. A lot of good insight into the front office side of things. Randy, thanks again for jumping on. My pleasure. It's good to be back. Um, seems like we've been on the, on the uh, gerbil wheel since then, and it hasn't slowed down. I actually love this time of year, and probably the biggest part of the year that I miss in being in NFL offices because I like the grind. I like the process of the draft, and, and obviously the team building has gone really crazy the last few weeks. So it's been fun. Be glad to visit with whatever you guys got. Yeah, where do you want to begin with the Bears? Like Adam said, so much has it has happened since then. Um, Justin Fields has been traded. Keenan Allen has been acquired. And it's full steam ahead right now with the with, with whatever's left with the evaluation of, of, of Caleb Williams. So right. I guess let's begin with that. You know, like what's left to figure out of, of Caleb Williams? And what do you make of the Bears' decision to trade Justin Fields? Well, I don't think either are surprising. I think we kind of have been able to see the the train coming down the tracks. We kind of knew it was going to happen. I know everybody was surprised by the, the only the, the amount that they were able to get in compensation for Justin. I'm sure you guys have been through it. Um, I think it's all about timing. 
and, and when when the music stops, you've got to find homes for certain players. Um, I wouldn't, if I was a Bear fan, get bogged down in the fact that they didn't get a lot for Justin. That's just the sunk cost and and the cost of doing business. To be honest with you, I I think they should be lauded in that they were able to find a spot for him that I think is a great spot and in an offense that. I think might be the best setup offensively for him to succeed. So, so that's good. I think the Caleb Williams one, a part of the, of the big picture has really been, you know, the question everybody had to answer was, can we feel comfortable enough with him the last two months to make the decision? And I think that was the number one thing Ryan Poles had to do. It wasn't evaluating him as a player. I think that was easy. We talked about that in Indianapolis, the player that you see on tape, we know what he is. It's all the other stuff that come with it, and it's the intangibles. It's the processing of information. It's the communication. It's the the it factor, right? It's being a leader, and and obviously they feel comfortable uh, with all those things now, and that's really what's transpired over the last six weeks is them kind of doing their research and making sure they're okay with this guy being not only the face of our team but really the face of our city. You've spent that that time period uh, doing your own digging as you uh, as you do, and I, I know you, uh, as we talked to you in Indianapolis about, uh, already knew a lot about Caleb Williams too. But is there anything new that's popped up uh, on on your end, or anything else that you've learned that's further completed your picture for Caleb Williams? You know, I haven't learned anything that would force me to have any hesitation, and and. I even talk to scouts and people in the NFL, and, and sometimes I chuckle when I hear, well, you know, his fingernails were this, or or he hugged his mom too much here. And I, I just shake my head and laugh, even at NFL people who bring that up to me, because you cannot find guys that can do what he does at the end of the day. So none of that bothers me. Um, I think his character is solid. I think he is a guy who is accountable for his own actions, and he owns who he is. And I like that. I think if he were to have a week or two where he struggled or played bad, I think he's accountable. And those are the things that have been said about him since high school. He is accountable. He understands it. Um, He knows it's on me if I play bad. And those are the important questions I want to get answered is I've never been around a quarterback or a team that the quarterback doesn't take his share of the criticism. And I think Caleb is one of those guys who is he's he'll stand up for it for himself, but he'll also stand up for his actions and knowing that, Hey, I I might screw some things up. I'm going to admit it and we're going to get better. And so that part I feel really good about. Um, I don't have any question that this guy's the right makeup for, for whatever NFL team he goes to, but obviously we think he's going to go to the bears. So like in, in terms of figuring out the person like behind the player, let's see, let's see the bears have had dinner with him and some of his teammates in Los Angeles. Uh, Matt Eberflus met with them one-on-one uh, before his pro day, uh, they went over some stuff on the whiteboard. He was at a visit to Hallis Hall. They had the combine visit where Kevin Warren and George McCaskey are in there. So I'm, I'm just curious, like in your experience, do you have like any stories where you really went the extra, what, what, what did some more extra things to figure out maybe the person behind the player, like in, in your experience? I'll be honest. I want to get in his world of unstructure. I want to get with what he likes to do in his spare time with the people that are around him all the time. And so I I might, especially with a quarterback, and I don't even know if Caleb Williams plays golf, but that might be on my checklist is I want to go do something with this guy outside the realm, just see how he reacts. I always felt like for quarterbacks, especially Golf was a great measuring stick because we all know that we think we can play golf, but we all know frustrated as hell more than not. And it brings up a lot of points as you play through a round of golf that reactions uh, and just observe how he how he does that. Now, if he were a golfer, I might find a way to do that. Just because I want to see how he accepts failure or doesn't, how, how his expectations hinder, how the frustration comes in. Because let's face it, Sundays are going to be a lot like golf, figuring really shit out that doesn't go right. And so I always felt like golf was good in that regard to get to know the people. Now, maybe there's another sport or another action or another task you can do to give you the same type of added, uh, same type of answers. I don't know. You guys tell me, I I just felt like that was a good idea. And and that's something I tried to do with quarterbacks from time to time. So have you, who have you played with and who have you beaten or who have, who's beaten you? (laughs) Rick Meyer a guy that we traded in Seattle to the bears years ago. 
I loved Rick and I loved playing golf with him. And I would come sometimes on the road when we were recruiting a free agent receiver in free agency or something like that, because then we could get to know these players out and away from the formal structure of a dinner or something like that. And I would purposely let Rick ride with the guy for nine holes and, and use that as a, just as a platform. It's, it's less about golf. It's more about uh, the environment, right? And he, People react to dirt, certain things. Part of the process is the process. So we might do something crazy. We might go to a hockey game and the guy has no interest in hockey at all, but I want to see how he interacts with people on the way in and on the way out, things like that. So just trying to get the guy, just to get to know him as a person more than anything. And, and by the way, I think that trade probably gives you more clout on this podcast, just you being on the other <laughs> side of that deal with the Bears. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to bring up a bad topic because I love Rick and and I've actually always been a Bears fan. So I I, I don't want to make anybody feel bad. That's for sure. Well, well, I do love the golf idea. I would love to see how Caleb Williams would respond to the uh, quadruple bogey Jordan Spieth had at 15 earlier this morning. Uh, that was in, yeah. you know pretty tough to watch. Right, or a, or a putt from three feet that he that he misses or something out of bounds. I want to see the reaction. I want to see the the adversity that he faces. Um, but again, why not try to let it bleed into real life if you can? Randy, the, the Bears are um, seemingly taking advantage of the position that they're in, um, you know, not being one of these teams that typically ends up with a number one pick because of how bad they were last year. Uh, this is a, a, a more of a unique situation for them, and they seem closer to a competitive window, and they've made an emphasis here to put – the right pieces, better pieces around the quarterback that they're going to be drafting. I'm just curious what you think about their team building process here and what you still think might be missing to help Caleb Williams. Well, I think they have a ways to go. I, I wouldn't consider them there yet. I know a lot of fans want to say, hey, we've turned a corner now. Um, I know Ryan Poles early in the process came up with a statement of we feel good about describing and evaluating it's the people and the intangibles that are the hard thing that's probably true um but i also think the evaluating is the is the bottom line as well and i just to kind of take it one step further i i asked myself before because before i came on the podcast what have to happen with the bears to make me feel really good and really get excited because obviously they have another pick and the team builder in me might have an idea that people would think i'm crazy to even consider but I can't get away from the offensive and defensive lines. And I think that's how you're going to build success for Caleb. And I know we spent a first round pick on the right tackle a year or two ago, right from Tennessee. Right. And there's a lot of people in Chicago that think this is, this player is this, or he's that for me, this is just me. I think the guy's a guard. I would love to see them take a tackle at nine and move him to guard. And all of a sudden we are big, we're powerful. I, I struggle with them at right tackle still. And I know this is a first round pick, but for me, I, I, I'm always wanting to get better. And if we can, if we could draft a, a, a tackle, even if it's a right tackle, move him to another position where I think we get a five of our best off line on the field. I think that would get me excited about the bears, but that's just me. One part of this process, too, is, well, Ryan Poles is on record saying that he thinks maybe the talent and the value in, in this draft kind of dips come, come day three. So what he's done is he's traded a fourth-round pick for Keenan Allen, a veteran receiver. He's traded a fifth-round pick for Ryan Bates, a player he's had his eye on for a couple of years now out of Buffalo, who will start at center. He's bringing in veterans, parting with draft capital for veterans. What, what do you make of that process, especially knowing – that you're taking a quarterback, number one overall. I like it a lot. I concur with what he's saying. I'll be honest with you guys. I don't think it's a great draft. I don't think it's a deep draft, and I've had a chance to dig pretty deep into it. I don't see this being great. So I like his. I like the fact that he's been able to act on it and find dance partners or trade partners. Um, I think it's good. I think veteran offensive linemen or really good tackles are all going to benefit this kid coming in. So I would say kudos, Ryan. It's a theory, and, and I like the fact you've been able to execute it. 
How do you, because that's been a pretty common sentiment uh, about the depth of this draft, but how do you feel about the first two rounds? Because I've also heard excitement about, you know, maybe the top 60 or so players uh, because I'm just, I think one of the things we're talking about here in Chicago is whether or not the Bears will try to trade back at number nine and try to add a little, you know, some more picks sort of in those first two. If they can add at least one more pick in those first two rounds, that would be ideal. Uh, But how do you feel like as you look at this class, how strong it is up top? I would agree with that. I think it's probably a dozen deep of what I would say blue chip type players. Uh, Beyond that, you pick somebody at 14, you you might get the same quality at 25. But having said that, I do think you'll get really good players in the second round and maybe the top half of that third. So, um, you know, 100 players deep. I think good. Acquire those picks if you can. And if you can slide back and there's a chance, I think, for teams willing to slide back that 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, there are other teams that mid first round, if they could pick up a a third round pick, I think we'll do it. The problem is supply and demand. And there's gotta be somebody that another team wants to go up and get. And so outside of maybe a Michael Penix or, or I guess some like the Knicks kid, that's the one reason to go up and get them. But if you're a team that's sitting there at 12 and, and back out of that spot, you may back out of the players too. So you've, you've got to find a, a little comfort zone there with how far down we can really go to acquire that extra third round pick. The interesting thing about, I think the number nine pick, which is the bears second pick is that it could be the first spot where a defender is taken, just given the offensive tackle value. And obviously the three receivers who are your, your, your favorite defensive players in this draft, who are your blue chip defenders that could be in consideration at number nine. I've seen some edge rushers that are really good rushers but so many of those defensive players, especially front seven players, it's all about the fit. So more mistakes get made with those picks than I think any other position. Edge players are, I won't say they're 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 not a dime a dozen, but they really it matters what scheme you put them in. I mean, the Dallas kid from uh, Alabama can really rush. The Latu kid from UCLA can really rush. Um, but they also come with being a little light in the back end and setting the edge and playing the run isn't exactly their strength. So to answer your question means that he can play almost in any scheme and he can play the run and pass. I don't know if I see that in this year's group, especially on defense. I don't even know if I see the corner, to be honest with you. And you're talking about defensive linemen and corners being the, the primary positions you'd love to draft up there. I don't know. I mean, time will tell, but Somebody's going to have to dig deep to show me a guy that I say, hey, this is this is the guy for us right now. I just think that's a that, that shows about the draft, right? That shows you that for me, there may not be a blue chip guy on defense that I'm willing to, to stake my next 10 years on. So so that means that you got you like a lot of the offensive guys in because you mentioned there's there's probably about a dozen blue chip guys in the draft and. Maybe none of them are, are defense. Uh, so if if we're talking line, because I'm with you, Randy, I think I think offensive or defensive line is is usually the smarter uh, way to go, especially if you're going to use that number one pick on the quarterback. I mean, is this uh, are you feeling good about the offensive tackles or the offensive linemen uh, in general? In, in you know, in that blue chip category on the other side of the ball, the Notre Dame kid Joel gets a lot of the attention, and I think he's really good. He draws comparisons to to McGlinchey, but I think he's a step up from that. So I think this this kid is, and I'm not looking for six eight tackles. Trust me, that's a, that's an issue for me in mo, on most years. So I think he's an outstanding prospect. I think the Penn State guy Fashana is good. I think there's a couple kids at Oregon State. I mean, a couple kids at Washington. I think these guys are all come in and play and start in the NFL as tackles their rookie year. So that's rare that five or six of these guys might come right out and, and start immediately. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's the strength. Not so not so fired up about guards and centers being picked that high, but you may you may see some of those guys go mid-round, mid to late first round, uh, again, based on the fact that there's supply and demand. And offensive line, we all see what they're getting paid. So they are, they are an option to be drafted and, and almost like a rookie be treated as a first time contract, a first, a player's first contract. Randy, always appreciate the insight. Thanks for jumping on with us today. I know you and uh, Mike are, are recording another episode here today. So we'll be on the lookout for that on the athletic uh, football show feed as well. Sounds good guys. Thanks a lot. Enjoy it.
Adam, I, I just love talking to Randy just because of the experience, the background. Um, he was telling us kind of after the recording there about how he played a role in Keenan Allen's drafting in well, San Diego at the time. And what did he say? He's going to be a vet. He's going to be valuable for the entire building, for the whole building beyond Caleb Williams. Um, obviously, I mean, we know, we know it's a major acquisition, but I do like the idea. And I think Randy agreed with, with us that drafting with draft capital can be okay when the veterans bring so much value, like in the immediate, right? When you have this rookie quarterback, like I like the idea that Caleb Williams is not just throwing the Tyler Scott Bayless Jones Jr. and a rookie to be named later, but it's Keenan freaking Allen, right? And even like to a lesser extent, Ryan Bates, where it's, I do like the idea of the Bears drafting a center at some point in this draft that they can make it work. But having a veteran in Ryan Bates, I, I, I get it with not that much experience. Like there's value though in the experience he does have, and then you you know you did sign a two year starter from this from I was almost at the St Louis Rams, the Los Angeles Rams as well. Yeah, I, look, I I mean I I kind of separate the Keenan Allen thing from the offensive line moves a little bit, um, because I think the caliber players, but I, but I much think they're different. in the same conversation when you're looking at this draft, this right. draft class having less of an impact come day three. Right, and that's why I'm okay with. You know, I think it depends your situation too. Um, but given the situation the Bears are in, the the, the depth of this draft or lack thereof, I understand the process um, that Ryan Poles is doing with some of those draft picks, and that includes trading for Montez Sweat last year with the second round pick um, and signing and acquiring. You know, now your number one pass rusher. And signing him to a long-term deal with that draft capital, so I'm okay with it. I'm I, I think there are exceptions to um, the rule, especially when it because we all know draft capital matters. But you can also make a lot of mistakes in bidding wars in free agency, and by jumping on Montez Sweat through trade and signing him long-term, you know you. I, th I think you put yourself in a much safer position in making an acquisition like that. And of course the results uh, early, early results have been outstanding, but Keenan Allen to me falls in that category. It's obviously different because he's much older. I don't think this is a long-term acquisition, but for what the bears need this year with Caleb Williams, I think it's great. Randy Mueller played a huge role in drafting Keenan Allen. Um, we'll get him back on the show at some point to get in a little bit more detail on that this was more about the draft obviously but you know randy works for the athletics so we'll get him back on the show hopefully with a slightly better connection at some point where we can talk a little bit longer and go into some of those stories about him and keenan allen because i i found that uh little information he dropped on us uh off the interview to be very interesting what did you make of his well his belief that for the number nine pick that Forget defensive line because I think he was, you know, very critical of the defensive players later in the conversation. But he seems to be all in on the idea of taking an offensive lineman at number nine for the Bears. Yeah, and I and I'm a hundred percent okay with that too. I didn't agree with you know his skepticism of Darnell Wright um, being better suited at guard. I think he can play guard, but I th I think he's a fine right tackle. I think the Bears actually believe that he might be able to play left tackle. Um, if they were have to, to draft a guy who could only play right right tackle right now. Um, I think Joe Walt's the dream. He's I think the more and more we look at this is separating himself as the obvious, you know, cornerstone left tackle in the draft. And because of that, I doubt he'll be available at number nine. That stud left tackle usually will go in the top five. Um, and if not, a few picks after that. So I, I think it'll it'll be tougher to acquire um one of those blue chip guys of course we don't know what the bears board looks like i do think though that there's there are some other options um if they end up trading back and that's kind of still what i feel like is the most likely scenario johns is that somewhere there is more draft capital acquired in all this even if it's you pick at nine and you traded one of next year's picks to get another guy this year in the second round. 
yeah, which is I, always an option to keep in mind too. And I, I think what Randy was saying about Darnell right? So it's a reflection of how evaluators, even within like the same organization, can have different beliefs, um, tastes, or, or just preferences in terms of where players fit, what they can do. Sometimes it's a matter of certain measurables. Arm length always comes in the conversation. Like Randy was saying, in terms of, of height, even like as big as Joe Alt is at 6'8", like you still want to see him have good pad level. And when you're 6'8", that could be a little hard um, yeah. in terms of gaining leverage. So, again, that's different um, just in terms of certain characteristics, how evaluators can see things differently. But I think he's of the same belief where I think Ryan Poles and Ian Cunningham are of the same belief that building the offensive line is like still the best way to go. And I think this is part of like our conversation from the last pod where I completely just, you know, don't hire me to be your lawyer if you need me to defend taking your receiver because the more I thought about it, the more I researched it, the more I didn't like it. As good as like a Roma Dunze is, like the idea of drafting a blue chip offensive lineman just became so much more appealing to me because I think that just carries more weight. Like just in terms of um, multipliers, I think offensive linemen multiply more than a, a receiver would. But, but here's the problem. And it wouldn't shock me if they end up in this situation. How many of these offensive linemen are actually considered blue chippers on their board? And is there one even available at their number nine? Whereas they may like, let me paint this scenario and I don't know what their board looks like, obviously, but let's just say Roma Dunze is one of their blue chip wide receivers and he's still sitting there at nine, but none of their defensive, uh, defensive blue chippers. Uh, maybe, maybe they're in agreement with Randy. There aren't really guys, or maybe like it's that next tier. where like, man, we're kind of reaching here at nine for one of those guys. And same thing at tackle because Joe Alt's off the board and whoever the number two guy is that they have on their board at tackle is also off the board. So it's like there, there's a world to me in which Roma Dunes, they might be the only blue quote unquote blue chipper left on the board. So it becomes a, well, do we just take that guy, even though they might think the same way that you and I have kind of laid this out with wide receivers recently? Or do they say, no, let's leave him with somebody else. Let's trade back. I mean, we get a couple of those second tier guys. I don't know. I just feel like that's a very realistic situation that they might find themselves in on draft night. I think the Darnell Wright selection could be a good we'll, we'll talking point here because I don't think... I, I know you you became higher on him as the draft press has played out, but most projections had him in what the twenties, mm -hmm. right? And he was a blue chip player for the Bears at an all important position, a premium position up front. And eventually, you know, they they traded back. I, I get it, but like the number ten overall pick, like that, that's again the same range that the Bears are in this year. I I think there's got to be like knowing what I've learned about the Chicago bears. Like, I think there's at least two offensive tackles in that blue chip range at number nine. One is all, and one is, I don't know, a player to be named later that we'll probably learn about if they take that selection. Like just knowing Ian Cunningham, knowing Ryan poles, knowing what happened with Darnell, Wright, There is a blue chip. There are at least two blue chip offensive tackles there for them at number nine. There's probably also a defensive player too that we're not thinking of that highly that they they might have in their blue chip category. I think I think the natural reaction from Bears fans listening to Randy Mueller make that comment about Darnell Wright playing guard was probably to roll their eyes and shrug it off. But to your point, reacting to it, it's more of an I, I, it's more of an a very real example of how much. NFL personnel guys disagree on some of this stuff. The disagreement, which is so we come up with these consensus boards and in the media and you know, at the end of the day, the top 20 for the most part doesn't have much a disagreement, but in those NFL draft rooms, they don't look the same. The, 
If you take eight blue chippers from the Bears and eight blue chippers from the Packers, I guarantee you there's two or three that are different. I think there's a video going around. Um, I saw it yesterday. I'm trying to pull it up right now. Um, where Here it is. Here it is. Um, it's, it's the Lions draft room where they're celebrating the Saints picking Chris Olave, right? Because they wanted Jamison Williams, the receiver. Mm. Who's the better player? Um, so far, yes. Olave, right? Yes, yeah. Yes. I, I, the, I thought you were asking me a trick question. There. No, Sorry. no, no. Oh, I guess it was kind of semi-rhetorical, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Like that's an example of, for whatever reason, the Lions didn't like Chris Olave. They like Jamison Williams, but you know yeah. what? The Lions evaluation, while well, well, great drafters at this point. Was wrong. Mm-hmm. Was wrong. Um, you know, when Randy was talking about blue chip defensive linemen and he wants players who can play the pass and the run and do different things. I don't know why, but I was envisioning Florida State defensive end Jared Verse because he could do that. He's more than just a pass rusher. He can play the run aggressively. He could set the edge. He doesn't mind doing that. He seems to have the the mentality that the bears want as well. Just the tenaciousness. He's got the production. He's got a great story starting off at a smaller school before going to Florida state. Like he strikes me as a blue chip possible player for the bears. If we're talking defenders and you want to make the investment on the defensive line. Yeah. To me, he's like a, a smaller version of Montez sweat. Honestly, the way he plays um, where he's just, max effort all the time you love the motor he's strong against the run just as much as he is as a as a pass rusher he has power um not necessarily the greatest bend around the edge but montez sweat wins anyway and that's the same thing with 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 jared verse so um i the more and more i looked at jared verse the more i preferred him over dallas turner who probably has more twitchiness and all those you know athleticism traits that you love i just think he's a more prototypical fit for what the bears want and kind of what they've been targeting at some of these positions this is it's like in some ways he's like the darnell right too like just on the defensive side just the more and more you watch the guy you just like he is just a solid plug and play player on in the trenches that you like day one day yeah. one and, and you know he's got a spot there a defensive end and you know byron murphy i, I know you're very high in him but i have a sense that the bears are going to give trevon dexter some some runway here in terms of the i agree with you yeah yeah as, as, as good as byron murphy could be um and maybe some of the measurables move him down the bears board, maybe out of that blue chip range, but the production, you know, the, the aggressiveness, the, his ability to get into the backfield is, is there on tape by Byron Murphy. But yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's kind of funny how we've gone from focusing squarely on what's happening at quarterback in the top pick to now we're finally on to number nine. And this seems to, to be the only point of discussion. You know, I think trading back is a real possibility just in terms of, teams feeling more comfortable moving into number nine instead of going all the way to number five or six. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, um, but it is a fun discussion. It's a little less uh, volatile than the, uh, what was going to happen at number one with the, with the quarterback stuff. So, um, it's been good. I, I, thanks to Randy Mueller for coming on the show today too. Um, and you know, sharing his wisdom and, and his thoughts, uh, man, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, ready for a Rick Meyer reference on the show. Uh, you know, he actually, I list, I like listening to him and Mike Sando, and I was listening, I think it was our most recent episode, um, and he actually dropped Rick Meyer's name on that one too because he was telling Seattle's side of that, and they had, they had two first-round picks that year, I think, and they think they ended up moving back up for another guy. I think that's what he was trying to explain uh, in, in telling that story with the trade that they made with the Bears by acquiring that other first-round pick in the Rick Meyer trade, which obviously didn't work out well for Look, when you win a trade, you win a trade. Yeah. <laughs> it's You know, for a while, wasn't that, you know, it was pretty easy to do against the Bears, I guess, but, you yeah. know, 
take. I, I like that. I like Rick. I like Rick Meyer. I like playing golf with them. And uh, oh, by the way, I you know crush <laughs> crush the Bears in that trade by trading him away. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of golf, Matt Eberflus is very good golfer. So yeah. I, I do wonder. I don't know. The weather's just getting better, but Caleb Williams. Is my understanding is just getting into golf. That's one reason why he was at what? What? Where was he at? He was, he was at the Players watching, Championship, watching uh, Rory McIlroy, right? Um, yeah, i yeah, I think he was following Rory that morning. Um, and and I, and again, I agree with all the fans that got incredibly upset at him for being there instead of training. I mean, God, you know, God forbid he goes and takes a day off from training at a tournament that's being held down the street from where he was training. Um, to watch some golf. It was a terrible move by him. He might even fall to number two because of it, now that I think about it. <laughs> if Randy Mueller golfed with me, I'd be off his draft board. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Adam Johns getting another uh, Modelo for, uh, you know, it's 10.30 a.m., but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know about that work ethic. Also, the way uh, the amount of f bombs that John Rom dropped on the course yesterday, I'm not sure how that would have gone over. But we will look good in our Hogan Johns golf polos. That's that's true. Which unfortunately neither of us wore today on the show, but we could. We could go to HoganJohns.com and get the golf polos um, for sure. Uh, those are sweet polos. Go get them if you haven't already. And it is officially golf season. I'm declaring it now. It looks nice enough outside. It's gonna be a nice weekend. The Masters is on TV. The wind might help with my slice. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, on half the holes. <laughs> True. Yeah. Then the then the, uh, the other half it won't. Um. All right, we're we are back next week with an episode with the Beast, Dane Brugler. He's going to join us on uh, Tuesday's episode as we uh, break down some of his findings. Of course, if you haven't already checked it out, um, as we mentioned earlier, the Beast, go get it. Any athletic, if you're an athletic subscriber, you get access to it. Go find it on theathletic.com. Uh, if you're not already a subscriber, theathletic.com slash Hogan Johns is where you go to subscribe. And uh, you can get access to the beast with write ups on over 400 prospects and de testing data. And I think he said almost 2,000. That's a crazy, I mean, it's, it's crazy, crazy that yeah. that many go through, even through the testing. I love the little fun facts like Cale Williams earned the nickname Bobby Boucher. When he played Pee Wee or Pee Wee hockey, you know what I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. When he played youth football. I love it. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch the Adam Sandler movie, the water boy, Bobby Boucher. I'm just, I don't, that wasn't the, the comp I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> the water boy scores touchdowns, man. I know, but just wasn't expecting Bobby Boucher for Caleb Williams. I, I like it. I don't have a problem with it, but that's why you get the beast because you just don't know what's going to be in there. Well, now I want to see the videos of Caleb Williams playing youth football when he's taking kids out. Yeah. yeah. Was, I, like, I would love he, to see he, it. Like he was, Bobby Boucher was always like squealing. <laughs> That was pretty good, actually. Yeah, it's pretty good. It was solid. My sons love the movie. Yeah, I don't know if James has seen that one. I have to. He's well, seen Happy some... Gilmore. Yeah. Well, back, okay. back to golf. All right. If if he's if he's handled Happy Gilmore, your son yeah. can fully handle the Water Boy. You know what's sad? We've we we've lost Chubbs, and um, I don't. This is bad because now I can't remember the actor's name or the. Uh, I don't know if they ever say the character's name though in the movie. But um, the the heckler when when and yeah. when we've lost Bob Barker too. But when 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 Adam Sandler, Bob Barker are golfing, Happy Gilmore in that scene, the guy who gets paid by Shooter McGavin to heckle him, uh, that actor I think passed away last week. Why am I blanking? What are you? Joe to Flaherty's say? name. Thank w you. Ken. What would he say? Um, you suck, you jackass. That's what he would say. <laughs> In the off season, you and I, and maybe the fish man should do a movie, not a movie review where we rank like the movies, the sports movies, but our favorite characters. Yeah. 
our favorite characters for movies. Like oh, Shooter McGavin, I think, is a hilarious character just because of how much of a jerk he is. Do you know that there's the Shooter McGavin Twitter account? Yes, yes, who plays up the part. But it's actually him. Is it really the actor? Yeah, it's Christopher McDonald. I think that's... I'm pretty sure that I have that right. But I'm pretty sure that Christopher McDonald's actual Twitter account is the Shooter McGavin Twitter account that's on Twitter. Oh, that's great. Like he I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Let me uh Kenton's telling us that Happy Gilmore 2 really is in the works. Yeah, Shooter McGavin on Twitter at Shooter McGavin underscore at the end, former number one golfer in the world, an all around bad guy. <laughs> Five hundred and eighty six thousand followers. <laughs> and I am relatively sure that Christopher McDonald's actually behind this this Twitter account. So, yeah, can't go wrong with Happy Gilmore. Um, all right, that's going to do it for today's episode. Appreciate everybody watching, listening. Uh, thank you for fighting through the uh, connection with Randy Mueller, especially if you're watching on YouTube. We know it didn't look phenomenal, but... Um, Great stuff still in there. Yeah, the, the content is what matters, and we appreciate him jumping on. We'll get him on the show again soon. Dane Brugler coming up next week. You can follow us on Twitter at Adam Hogue, at Adam Johns. Get those golf polos at hoganjohns.com. Talk to you next week. Oh, hold on. See ya.